25 years ago, the music industry was in the midst of a crisis. Every year from 1999 all the way to 2015, the music industry saw a growing and decreasing loss of revenue. This was a 15 year downward spiral of recorded music, album sales, tours, and it felt next to impossible for an artist to break through unless they had the backing of a massive label that could maybe get them on the radio. But in 2014, a little company called Spotify came along and changed the music industry forever. The innovation of music streaming. This technology revolutionized the industry and turned that 15 year loss into a growing industry every single year since. This is the same time period when Spotify was founded in 2008. We saw the rise of YouTube, Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, Vine. Audiences wanted on-demand content, yet the music industry was not giving it to them. Spotify simply saw the problem. Technology had progressed long past the times of tuning into a radio station and hoping there was a good song that they might play. So how did they do it? How did one piece of technology take a 15 year decline and turn that into a rapid growth that completely redefined an industry? That is the Spotify effect. It is the power of self-awareness and curation. Many of the smartest innovators realize that they don't have to be the main character. In fact, it's their job to be a bridge, not to center themselves and act as a bridge between the audience and the communities that they are seeking. Spotify is this beautiful bridge of discovery to connect listeners and artists and has given the power of choice to users to anyone, anywhere, anytime. And in 2024, the music industry is really the biggest it's ever been. We saw two of the highest grossing tours this year, this rapid globalization of music, artist self-publishing is at an all-time high, distribution through indie labels is at an all-time high, new music discovery, and Spotify itself has paid out over $40 billion back to labels, artists, and the industry as a whole. Nothing made this beautiful evolution more apparent to me than when I was reading the Grammy's Best New Artist nominations this year. There are artists who are on their first year in their industry to artists who have been songwriters for 10 years. There's country to rap to pop to R&B. Like, it was an amazing year for music. And who better to talk about the evolution of music and how Spotify redefined that industry than the global head of editorial at Spotify herself, Selena Ong. With 25 years of experience in the industry, Selena has worked everywhere, from artist development at labels like Sony to directing international marketing initiatives at Live Nation. Even at Spotify just alone, you have headed artists and label services, head of music in the mm -hmm. UK, and now you oversee the entire global editorial content. She is an absolute icon of the industry, and we could not be more excited to chat with you all about the Spotify effect today. Welcome back to the Share Your Screen podcast. Hi, my name is Nikki. I'm Coco. And please welcome our first guest, Selena Ong. Hello, I'm so happy to be here and what an introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, I was so, so excited when, when you guys reached out and like, I think what you do is is specifically like this curation of music yes. is so, so interesting for where the industry is heading. Honestly, I would love to hear you just like describe like what is it really that you and your team do? Yeah, so I'm... I'm the global head of editorial at Spotify. And what that means at Spotify, in very simple terms, is that my teams and I listen to a lot of music, <laughs> right? It's our job, absolutely our job, to listen to all the music that's submitted to us um, through Spotify arti for artists in our pitch tool. Mm -hmm. So we listen to music and we're responsible for curating that music and also thinking about where else in the app that I can introduce you yeah. to your next favorite song. Um, and when I really boil it down to first principles, that that's that is the beauty of the job that I still and my team still never take for granted. And it's a huge privilege, a to be able to introduce you to your next favorite artist, to your next yeah. favorite song, and then to be part of that journey. It's very it's very satisfying to see when you discover a song as a curator. Mm -hmm. And you introduce that to various audiences, you test it, and you, you see it doing well and that people are enjoying it. And also the other, the other uh, aspect that we're really focused on as an editorial team is discovery. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for the latest sounds, uh, be that coming from anywhere around the world. For example, K-pop, I'm a piano. These were all conversations that came out of what we call our global curation groups, which means basically all the editors around the world get together every week and we talk about what's happening in our local countries and scenes. Yeah. And then also um, discovery 
and also introducing new music and new artists and trends. We're very focused on culture and trends, what's in the zeitgeist, what's bubbling, what's around the corner. That is the currency that we trade in. I love that. I mean, I... Everything you said is crazy to me because, yeah. like, none of that was even possible ten years ago. Like, I don't think ten years ago, France radio stations were calling America to like have a discussion about what's performing well. But and, it's so cool and, to see a and Spotify. vice versa yeah. as well. It's yeah, like, yeah. You know, the interesting thing is um, a, and the other side. I always think about curation and what we do as I describe it as the art and the science. So the art is the listening to music, the ears. Um, the trends, the understanding of the culture. And, and there's art in how you sequence uh, a playlist when you're curating or how you uh, decide how to program something. So it's in the best environment for you as a listener yeah. to take that in and to enjoy it. And then there's a science of it, which is understanding that technology, um, AI, machine learning, data. That That is the marriage of the two. And what I think Spotify has been understood from the start is the combination of human curation with the best of technology. Um, that has always been what has given Spotify a lead in terms of, as an industry, in terms of the editorial and curation te- teams. Yeah, I remember when I was in college, all my roommates, my sophomore year had Spotify, and that was when I downloaded it. And I was listening to a playlist, I think it was like Lorem or Pollen, like one of yeah. those playlists that I love. And I heard this new artist, and I went to follow her on Instagram. Her name was Where Are the Avocados, and she had 2,000 followers. Billy, yeah. Ended up being Billy, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And ever since then, I just have been loyal to Spotify. But do you have any like anecdotes or stories where maybe – an artist has even reached out to you guys and been like, this playlist changed my life or moments like that? Yes. I mean, we, again, I always think about, I really loved what you said in your introduction about we don't center ourselves. We're not the main character. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. Um, And it's a ethos and a philosophy that we really stick by because it's always about the music, the audience and what's happening culturally. We're a conduit for that, right? We channel it, we we get it out there, We, we but we're not the main character. It's right. not the mm-hmm. Selena Ong show by any stretch of the yeah. imagination. Um, and so that is a privilege to be able to uh, introduce an artist to an audience. And I think the latest one, I you know, I, I remember Arlo Park saying when she was on the cover of of Lorem and Paul, and that was really special to her because this is these are playlists that she had really grown up and were influential for her listening. It introduced her to other artists, mm-hmm. and then for her to then make the cover of that playlist was particularly meaningful. And we hear that it's so lovely to hear that, and I never tire of it. <laughs> I'm <laughs> always grateful yeah. for it um, when artists say that, um, and. Also, I can remember the first time David was on the cover of of Antipop. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And it was just so nice to see the excitement. Like, I think sometimes people ask, well, do you get get blasé about? Not at all. Not ever. It's one of the, the nicest things about the job, and it keeps you... You know, it just reminds you why why you do it. And um, it's very wholesome. It's very pure. Yeah. Well, I also yeah. think that's why specifically like this human element that you're yeah. discussing is important. I also something you said earlier that I, that really, really resonated with me was also just like talking about um, discovery mm. and also how it is simultaneously easier it's ever been to be an artist. And we have more artists yeah. like actually generating a living than there has ever been in recorded history. Yet there is also like... I think some problems with that too. And Mm -hmm. I think your team specifically is like so geared around this like discovery versus conversions problem where like a lot of the people I've talked to in in the industry or like who work in music and the consulting side have been very like, we can grow someone on social, but we can't do, we struggle to like, how do you physically get an audience to leave an app and open Spotify? But so much of what your team does is like focusing around like, how can we actually like, give you new music while you're already in the app how are we you know like playlists or just even like the things in last week like day list is like a huge i mean completely took over so i'm so interested to hear like specifically how can artists be better at converting to streams so when i think about zooming right out um we live in an age where 
we're always connected, we're always on. There, as you said, there's so much content, whether that's music, film, video, I mean, everything is content. And so the challenge now is in an age, in an age driven by technology, how do you cut through? That is the universal challenge for many of us. And it's what I think about, not just for artists, but also when I think about how, do, how am I going to get your attention? How do I introduce you to the song and artist and get your attention from the myriad of things that you have <laughs> yeah. in your day? Um, and that's really about context. And I think that social media really has absolutely been a disruptive, transformational technology that's been introduced over the past 10 or so years. Um, and it feels like it has sped things up and artists are able to speak directly to their audience. That's, that's a very, uh, that's a very important point. But the other side of it is that that artist development work can't ever be skipped. And if you get a viral moment or you get traction socially, that's great, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. And growing a career as an artist from live to merchandise to streaming, um, I, my background is also in artist management. So you, you, it's really, it's spinning many plates. Mm -hmm. Social media is one aspect. Getting, if you're able to get a viral moment or get uh, some audience attention from that, you then need to parlay that into your your fan base on Spotify and your listenership. And that involves making sure that a few things, like that is always woven into your call to action when you're talking to your fans. Can they, can they go through and have a listen to your catalog? Are you creating your own artist playlist on Spotify? And then on our side, we are also doing the work of thinking thoughtfully about how to place that music at the right time um, for you to, to discover it. And also not just one, uh, the goal is, okay, you might listen to it once, but I want you to come back. I want you to come back and explore the artist catalog. I want you to go deeper into this playlist or this, or this uh, ex listening experience, because we have many listening experiences now on Spotify. The other thing is I think people always Obviously, the playlist is kind of the central format that we're known for, but there are, that's one side. You've got recommendations, you've got radio, you have a, a DJ, which we've been involved in as well. And so my programming influences across all of these things. As you said, like maybe you feel like Dayless, it's ephemeral, it's mm -hmm. fun, it's like... It's a little bit of like you compare it with your friends. Like that was all thought of at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean you want to do, you want to listen that way 24 seven. And that's the thing. Like I have to think we have to think about what how you might like to listen in a day. And it's not just the one me thing on the menu. Um, so in the same sense, my, you know, my my when I'm asked to give advice um, for artists is pitch to us. Spotify for artists really is there and we read every pitch and you don't need to have a huge team or a major label in order to, to pitch that to us. Mm -hmm. um, and also just telling us a bit about the song makes, uh, I read every pitch when I'm, when I'm curating. Yeah. And, and I can remember one pitch that really struck me was from a black queer artist who in his pitch was telling me about how this song was about him coming out. Mm -hmm. And it was really moving. And so those moments and those, those, that opportunity to tell us more about the music and the influence is really, is really important to us to, to have that context. Because it allows me to yeah. then think about how to give that context I'm, back to the listener. It's absolutely nuts that every single pitch that gets sent to you is read by yeah. someone on your team. Like even that I think is amazing. Like it's absurd that that's possible today. Which is why we're quite an elusive bunch because we're usually got <laughs> headphones <laughs> on. Yeah. Um, I like, for example, on, on my average day, I will do a minimum of three hours of music listening every day, usually more. Wow. And that's seven days a week, no matter if I'm... Wow. It's my birthday or my mm -hmm. on my holiday. I did uh, an hour and a half this morning. I'll probably do the another hour and a half at some point today, minimum. That's awesome. Yeah. And something else you said that I loved is like, I've always loved this quote. It's um, like when talking about your purpose or like the purpose for making music. It's like uh, everybody knows what you do, right? You're yeah. a musician. Everybody knows that. How you do it, it's a little more interesting. Maybe yeah. you use a certain software. Maybe you have a certain producer. Uh, but why you do it? 
why you do it is this like unique piece of your human story, right? Like him being a black queer artist, having a very specific coming out story with his yeah. family in the area he grew up with. Like no one else can write that song. Totally. And I think when thinking about pitching, it's like, mm -hmm. don't say what or how you do it. We yeah. know, you know, yeah. that you know, yeah, like yeah. you've been in music for a while. Or for example, like these are my tour dates. It's like, doesn't really, t no, I can look yeah. that up. Um, but, but you nailed it. I mean, yes, a very astute, um, observation and we see that so if we look at the best new artist nominees please right you see that come through when you're talking about personality authenticity mm -hmm. what are the things that um, really are only unique to you you see that reflected in these artists who have been nominated this year right from the spec they're all very different from one another Fair. it's like one of the most just diverse in terms yeah. of like every way possible like yeah. genre years in the industry it's 100%. it's beautiful it's literally like a symptom of the way i think the industry is evolving and i totally and it's a reflection of where we are in terms of where music is right now it very much is like the diversity uh the fact that they have all very different backgrounds but actually the through line is that they're all they all have a very clear uh positioning as an artist they know mm. who they are uh, and that comes across to their audience, whether it's the focus on the songwriting uh, and the topics that they broach to the aesthetics or a combination of all of those things. Um, but the through line is the auth authenticity and, and knowing, um, having a very clear vision of who they are as an artist. Um, so that is what's interesting. And I think even as the Recording ca Academy has changed the criteria, actually, for this category yeah. over the years, over the mm -hmm. past 15 mm -hmm. years, that has evolved, too. I know. Um, to where we are today, we're actually, yep. we're at a point where the criteria allows for artists who have been in the industry for mm -hmm. some time, like mm -hmm. Jelly Roll, for example, yeah. I mean, has like 10 studio albums. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, yeah, going... It Sorry, to, it's just so good to hear you say that because something Nikki and I have talked about in videos is how um, the Grammys, Best New Artists, like it's more about someone becoming mainstream in the public conscience, even if they've yeah. been doing it for years like Glass Animals. Yeah. Yeah. And people, I think, think like, well, they have to be like 15 and just to put out their first song to be nominated. Yeah, right. Like it's not, it's more about breaking into mainstream. Yeah. And, right. and I think too, something that, is about like their authenticity and maybe if someone's an artist listening or a team like also thinking about what playlist you would be on because mm -hmm. even these artists have such interesting i mean yeah. i've been in like meetings that, like, work backwards. where would you yeah what yeah. playlist yeah. and how do you fit in that like for example coco jones um is on a playlist called makeout jams yes. and it's just <laughs> like those very yeah. like the niche you go the quicker you grow kind mm -hmm. of thing is so fascinating and my question to you too is are there or like Jelly Rolls on New Boots, which is yeah. a country, like, are there certain playlists that are really competitive for people to get on? Are there, or are there very niche playlists that like might be smaller, but artists are clamoring because they know it's gonna. Yeah. I think it, um, it's both. Okay. So we think about, uh, when we think about our playlists and how we curate, we talk about a playlist ecosystem. And what that means is that there's the top of the pyramid, which is like today's top mm. hits. Um, that is kind of like the apex mm -hmm. of you're going through all the way from from maybe a, a niche, an audience niche, right through to breaking into that mainstream where it is it is a hit that most people will will know. But the rest of the of the pyramid is super interesting, and an artist's journey can start off in something like what we call a genre feeder, like, um, you know, a pop rising, for example, or new mm -hmm. pop picks. Yeah. Uh, Fresh Finds. So Fresh Finds is, our, is a program which we are focused on selecting very, very early tracks. Steve Lacey was, was on Fresh Finds with his that's very awesome. first track. Yeah. And then he ended up at the apex yeah. on today's yeah, yeah, top yeah. hit. So that's a really good example of that journey. We His first track... We're like, wow, this is super interesting. He was an independent artist at that time because mm -hmm. Fresh Finds is focused on independent artists. Went into Fresh Finds and then it grew from there, got signed to to a major label and, and his trajectory, as we know, has been yeah. amazing. But there are many places. So we think about, A, I have to introduce, how do I introduce this new artist and song to someone? And usually very thoughtfully, like just what you said is like, you need to think about where it fits as an audience. Is it, can I introduce it into like a mood and moment playlist? Like we, we have a playlist called uh, Pov main character. Um, 
songs to sing in the car. Like yeah. those are kind of easy entry, po entry points as well as like the niche um, kind of culture ones like mm -hmm. Lorem and Pollen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then everything in between. And then we go into like the hits flagships that kind of denote like you're gaining, you're, you've got an audience, you've got a fan base. You're kind of really kind of moving up those, those ranks. Um, but also there are many different entry points for an artist. I also think, ab think about Dermot Kennedy, who actually ended up on his first track, ended up on Discover Weekly, an algorithmic playlist. As an editor, we noticed that it was doing well. And we're like, okay, interesting. We're going we're gonna to test some of these songs. And it did really well. And Dermot also himself has talked about this, where he said that he started noticing he was getting more people at his gigs. And he couldn't work out why. <laughs> so he asked them, like, how did you yeah. hear about me? And they're like, oh, so through Spotify. You ended up on a Spotify playlist. Mm -hmm. And that's how he grew his audience. And um, so we think very thoughtfully about where things are placed. Like when I think about, you know, someone like Noah, Noah Khan, mm -hmm. right? Straddles quite a few, yeah. few genres from country to folk to singer-songwriter to pop. Um, so whilst he might have started out in more of the Juniper, Juniper is one of our newer playlists that focus on singer-songwriters, you know, whilst he might have started on some of the folk singer-songwriter playlists, mm -hmm. we noticed it was doing really well. We're like, we actually think he's got a broader audience. Let's yeah. test it in Pop Rising, right? More of a female. Interesting. Like, heavily pop skewed. You wouldn't, wouldn't not like you yeah. wouldn't, didn't know yeah. how it was going to go. Reacted really well. And actually, interesting with Noah, um, over 50% of his audience on Spotify is younger, so Gen Z, yeah. and 60% female. Interesting. Whoa. Which I wouldn't See, have I, thought would... I wouldn't have thought female. Yeah. That one surprised me. Gen Z got me, because one of the things, my prediction saying, <laughs> I think Noah Khan's going to win Best New Artist, just Nikki's opinion, um, is like, he, I was thinking, like, when was the last time we really got an Ed Sheeran-esque figure you know what i mean like i guess hosier oh, yeah like th someone that just could combine this lanes of like almost folky country and pop really yeah. well and i mean really i think we haven't had that since like 2017 like hosier yeah. was when he blew up so then when i saw like an, a noah kahan and he even has the most amount of monthly listeners out of anyone on this list i was like oh of course someone like this like this is what it's so funny how you know as media changes it somehow always stays the same a bit yeah. and like it, it's so clear that the industry was craving a noah yeah. kahan you know what i mean it is and that's interesting in terms of when you think about um also, there's a very interest. Uh, I'm very pleased to see this again. A focus and interest on because I think I heard for a, a lot of moaning for some time about oh, the state of music is terrible, and <laughs> and I'm like I couldn't disagree more. Yeah. I'm like you, you just I I disagree as well mm -hmm. totally, and I think that that and that's where I always see the opportunity is like how do we as an editorial team address that so yeah. for someone who thinks all music right now is rubbish that's a challenge for me <laughs> I like, hold my drink I like I'm, that. Gonna, I'm gonna prove you yeah. wrong you love yeah that. what playlist would you recommend to someone who thinks it's rubbish right now like, so it depends on the taste profile right okay. so i would always like to know a little bit about where they are in the wheelhouse because mm -hmm. if if you're seriously maybe really love hip-hop but not into dance then i'd mm -hmm. tailor that um <laughs> but if I'm thinking about a playlist that we've launched recently that really spoke to some of the trends that we were seeing, it's Juniper because Juniper was launched pretty recently and it really speaks to that move or that focus to classic singing, singer songwriter mm. topics and subjects. And you see that in the vein of the success of Zach Bryan, yeah. Noah, I mean, Gracie Abrams as well, very focused on. Sing like writing uh, songs that really speak to the things that she experiences, mm -hmm. mental mental health issues, etc. Yeah, and that is connecting with an audience. So it's very different, actually. When I hear people go, "Well, today's audience just doesn't care; they just they don't care about good music." That's not true, and we and we see this here. Um, the other interesting thing as well is like I love the 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 cross pollination of everything like Gracie on tour with Taylor, mm. Gracie mm -hmm. and Noah yeah. doing a track together, mm -hmm. Warren Treaty and Zach Bryan doing a a track together. Actually, 
the track on Zach Bryan's album, which War and Treaty are on, is the second most streamed song off his album, only after the Casey Musgraves track, which is a spectacular song. So you have all of this. And obviously Ice Spice as well, working with a lot of different artists. Fred and she's again. she's connected to Taylor, who's connected to Gracie. Yeah. Exactly. And another one I was going to say was Victoria's been a writer for Ariana for years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Victoria, yeah. a very, very seasoned writer. professional and a writer. Yeah. Same with Fred. And and I think they, they when you look at their, how their path to becoming a nominee, mm -hmm. I think what they have all really done well is understand where they are in the landscape. So when we look at someone like Fred, really had been a producer and a writer for some time mm -hmm. in the business for other artists. Yeah. COVID and lockdown was where it all came together mm -hmm. because people were in lockdown yeah. and can't go out. Um, and his most streamed song is literally called We've Lost Dancing. Exactly. It's about exactly what you're describing. So it was tapping into something broader. It's a yeah. zeitgeist yeah. moment. Um, and I can remember hearing that song for the first time, and I got chills. I got goosebumps mm -hmm. on my neck. Me too. Because it nailed everything yeah. that people were feeling and, at the time. And I think it's also so rare to see someone who's like, like you don't think of EDM as like sending a message, you know what I mean? And I think that's yeah. also really the magic of Fred yeah. again. It's yeah. like he can combine, like you could dance to it in a club, you can <laughs> dance to it at Coachella, yeah. but also like there is a strong takeaway. And talking about and branding yourself as yeah. an artist, like I really think that's his lane that he's found so well is like how to deliver a message in music that typically isn't known for that. A hundred percent. And then, you know, coming to Coachella with with Skrillex and and Fortet, I mean mm -hmm. that was the most his moment. Yeah. I mean. People were beside themselves trying yeah. to understand when was that going to happen? Yeah. How do I get to that set? Yeah. Um, so they had the most, the most gossip-worthy FOMO moment at Coachella. Absolutely, oh, yeah. sure. I'm sure everybody who went only weekend one was sour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that was me. I, was yeah. it? Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, I feel like everybody was talking about that set. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I I would listen. I would watch it. But um, I also think that Fred again is potentially one of the first ever nominees for Best New Artist who had already headlined Coachella, yeah. albeit mm -hmm. ex extraordinary circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. But also, um, so one question I have, and we asked mm -hmm. our Discord about mm -hmm. how they operate on Spotify and find new music. We got a few good comments. Um, one of them was saying, like, the blend feature with yeah. friends is huge. Yeah. Um, I think that's such a cool tool. Also, what I'm fascinated by, and it's how I really loved Spotify, is user-generated playlists. Yeah. Like, they're so niche. Like, I found some of my favorite songs. Yeah. There's this random playlist that I found once, and it was like, you're in the French country. Like, it's a, clearly some kid yeah. made it. It's like you're in the French countryside with your extended family listening to Lana Del Rey. <laughs> and I turn it on every, and I'm like, this is the best. But do you guys really value like these user Absolutely. kind of so, generated? So I look at those. Okay. We all do. I love because um, I love the creativity. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think still one of my favorite user playlists, <laughs> which I just laughed so hard, songs to get railed to. I'm like, that's <laughs> such a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's like a it's like a non watered down makeout jam. I, I think like, there's yeah. like also this magic of like tying a playlist to a specific time yes. or like event is like so like for me I have a shower playlist and it's like I listen <laughs> to it every day. This is this exactly. is the thing. So whilst yes we have the big culture playlist like Pollen mm -hmm. and Lauren which a lot of people already know, but I always say like don't forget about those mood and activity playlists because actually they they take up a big part of your of your listening. Uh, menu of your mm. in, in your day in terms of how yeah. you want to les listen those are really powerful too because i've heard a lot of people say oh i got i i found this artist from listening to songs to sing in the shower mm -hmm. so it's a that's that's how we we put together when we're thinking about like okay we have we believe there is a great song here that people will like how do we where where are we going to put it and so it's it's thinking about these other avenues, whether it's, um, you know, recommending that it shows up in a blend recommendation, mm -hmm. um, which is algorithmic, or whether it's um, getting DJ to introduce it to you, because that we have a writer's room and editors contribute to the script and putting more context, or is it in one of our editorial lists? So that's how we, that's how we approach it. So it's really thinking, I think about everything, it's like a toolkit. I have a, a set of tools here, and I need to build um, 
various different pieces in order to, to get yeah. the music to you. And I mean, even like reverse engineering it from the artist's perspective, yeah. I think there's so much value in being like, okay, well, this is what the toolkit of someone like you is thinking about. So like, how do I, going back to something you mm -hmm. said earlier, like essentially writing a song for a playlist mm -hmm. or like writing a song for time of day, a mood, a location or being in the yeah. car. Like I've definitely noticed that there's, I also love the way you describe music as like a menu, like the yeah. idea of like a breakfast, mm -hmm. lunch and dinner. Yeah. Because my, what I listen to in a day definitely changes based if it's it nighttime or morning. Exactly, nighttime, morning, what you're doing, right. what mood so you're in. I, I think that's like a beautiful, if I was an artist, I think that's like a beautiful exercise to be like, what is somebody doing? Doing when they're going to be listening to your song yeah. where are they who are they with blah 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 and reverse engineering that back to mm -hmm. like the creation process is really cool i always enjoy i think again one of the privileges of the job i actually just came from a from an artist meeting where the artist took me through um the new album mm -hmm. um and it's 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 always you can't beat an artist telling you <laughs> yeah how yeah how it came to be all the things that might go into that creative process. That's really valuable for us to also know and to hear. A, it's, it's a very vulnerable thing for an artist to speak to someone they don't know very well mm -hmm. and play music pretty much usually for the first time outside their like, artist team and, what, and have that person that listen to it. And so the other thing as well is like that. that is – a very vulnerable moment for an artist to be in. Again, extremely valuable, never take it for granted. Yeah. And that creative process on how they come, it varies very differently. I mean, you have artists that sometimes start with, it might be an image that sparks the yeah. concept. Um, and so it's always interesting to see and the ver how that varies across an artist to artist to artist because it's always so different. Yeah, and I mean, I also think there's no like one size fits all solution to music anymore. Yeah. I felt like that was like a big shift. Like when the first like internet boom started to happen and like music had been so heavily reliant on these like very traditional media pipelines, yeah. like radio, Disney channel, MTV, that type of thing was it's like going back to something you even said earlier, like it's never been easier to be discovered, but I think it's yeah. never been harder to brand yourself because the more people there are, the more you have to differentiate yourself or like have a lane in the way that you're describing. Yeah. And I think there's the, there's a task of getting your first listen, mm -hmm. getting your first mm -hmm. listeners. And then the task after that is to making them come back and then actually be invested in you. And then you have a fan base mm -hmm. that, that is, ultimately the journey that that an, an artist has to has to go on um now we help along all, all all of that and even looking at the at the nominees for example like i spice and coco were on our mm -hmm. artist to watch list in 2022 mm -hmm. um so again like we, when I look at like when we first supported these artists, it's usually on their very first track. It, it goes yeah. back like years. And you're finding them from the pitches, or like is it labels Both. coming so, in, or a, a combination of all of those things? Okay. Like I, I get asked a lot, like do you do you pay attention to what's happening outside, or do you just look at what's happening at Spotify? It's both. You can't curate in a vacuum. Mm. I can't curate or understand what's happening in the zeitgeist if I'm not tapped into it so absolutely i am across everything i'm looking at social media i'm on discord i'm a heavy gamer so <laughs> um so when you mention your discord i'm yeah. like i want to be in that discord chat because oh, you'll I'm, love it because i love discord so yes. i'm you know i'm in i'm in mmos i'm chatting with people i'm looking at what's happening on social media i'm also looking at uh what's happening on the live side, how are people... I go to shows and I look at the audience because mm -hmm. I want to see the type of people who are on the, uh, mm -hmm. in the audience. That, to me, is always very interesting. Then I come back and I look at Spotify and I'm like, where is... Is it similar? Is it different? Um, these are all the, all the sp data points that we are... Because all of those are data points. Like People think that it's just numbers on a screen, but actually going to a live show and looking at the audience, that's a data point that you've got in your head um, that fills out the picture yeah. of where that artist is and where perhaps what trajectory or path they might be going down. Is there an artist that you've been really 
like taken aback by their audience like they just had a really loyal audience or maybe yeah. we went to a jasmine bean show recently and oh wow yeah and their, their audience yeah. like she, they the the wedding gown like the veils they were all wearing like, it it was like halloween stage. you would have thought like every it single so person cool. was in a costume and it was like again talking really. about strong branding yeah like, it was so cool have see. you had that yeah. at a show where you're like whoa this is i get it now like yeah i think that for me that was uh it was when we were an editor, one of one of our editors in Mexico, um, created this playlist called Sad Sireno, and I'm like, "What's Sad Sireno?" And he's like, "Well, it's what I've called this playlist because it's the vibe of these younger artists who are um, really young, but uh, interpreting a very traditional Mexican genre, Sireno, with all the beautiful guitar work." But they're young and and the vibe is much sadder. So and actually that then got picked up by the press and now it's like a genre term, a subgenre term, sad sireno. Cool. And I didn't understand it until I actually went to see um, uh, Euritia Sensia perform and see their crowd. Where I'm like, the guitar work is beautiful, and it really harks back to a very traditional genre. But how they look, how they perform, and their audience is completely new. So, and they knew every single word, not just Spanish speaking kids in there, but also yeah. a, a good mix mm -hmm. of people from different backgrounds who weren't, and myself, I, unfortunately, I don't speak, speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I need to, need to get with the program and learn. Yeah. <laughs> that was super interesting to me because I'm like, this is something different that I have not seen before. And yeah. I, without being there physically to see that, to see the interaction, it really fills out the picture totally. for you. And it's so hard to like measure community. Yeah. And I, but like music is very much a community sport. Yeah. Like people can get numbers. That doesn't mean they build ticket sales. Doesn't mean yeah. they build shows. It doesn't mean yeah. all of that. So I think exactly what you're describing too. Like it's a, a data point is such a great way to look at it as like, you have your audience, but also like who shows up for you yeah. is something else to consider. I even go to the merch table and look at the people who are Buying like out of, out of out of all of these people here. Who's going to the merch wow. table? What That's are they so buying? Yeah. Um, because again, it's just like an interesting like what. That's a very same thing in Spotify. Like it, it's one thing to listen to a song. So the first level is listening to a song. Mm -hmm. The second level is coming back and exploring the catalog, listening to other songs, mm -hmm. but also liking it or adding it to a playlist. That is yeah. the most highly engaged mm -hmm. level of a listener that I can get. So what it takes to, to move you through that, whether that's in Spotify or the equivalent of that would outside of it is actually buying merch, investing in of your money into mm -hmm. an artist's merchandise or a ticket. Like, these are these are fan like hev heavy fan engagement actions. Mm -hmm. So I'm also really interested in what does it take to get you to that point because that's when you that's when you're you're, you're pretty much in. I think right now with kind of the way the world is like people are seeking out those third spaces or maybe mm -hmm. they're not going into an office or going into school as much and so one way to seek out community is through the artists that you love like it's mm -hmm. like these and also playlists like it sounds silly but i've bonded with people who know the lorem or pollen playlist like i'm like oh we're like the <laughs> yeah. same like, those two playlists are good examples of like community and that's yeah. what we, we aim for and it's why yes uh you know, introducing emerging artists and, and being part of that journey is is definitely important. It's one of the things that get, gets us up in the morning. But really, my main focus as well, concurrently to that, is discovery and also the audience. So, mm -hmm. and what's happening culturally? Because if I if we build something that speaks to that, like Lorem mm -hmm. and, and Pollen, that in itself, you know what that represents. Mm -hmm. It's a strange thing to articulate, but mm -hmm. you know. If, if you're part of that, you know that there's an aesthetic, there's a vibe mm -hmm. that, and actually that can change over time. So lorem can also change in terms of its meaning over time. Yeah. Let's think about like there's a playlist that we launched about two and a half years ago called Fonk, P H O N K. And that was launched by an editor in Russia who was noticing this new sound, um, very heavily associated with gaming. And I started hearing it too when I was gaming in my own spare time. And that that scene has changed from what was drift funk, which is a very specific sound. 
And now it's becoming broader and a lot of the Brazilian funk is now coming more into the center. So that just shows how communities, as he said, yeah. mm-hmm. can also change yeah. um, and evolve and move around. So nothing is ever static. It's always fluid. That's the other thing. So I think whenever I hear anyone that says, A, my, my guidance is always have an open mind. Things always evolve. Um, and you never know everything. Like anyone who says, oh, yeah, I know it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, they're lying. Yeah. And also, <laughs> I think you generally want to be the, the dumbest in the room in any room you walk into. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as someone also, like, who's, again, like, really this focal point, like, you are the bridge between artists and fans. Like, what are you most excited about in the way that Spotify is trying to connect people with new music in the next year? Um, our focus is very much on on discovery and new music. Mm. Um, so the continued focus on new artists and, and supporting them. And, and But new music, I hear a lot, like, no one listens to new music anymore. It's all about catalog. Again, a bit of extreme take. Like, there's room for both. Yeah. I think that, that it is important to support new music because you want that pipeline of yeah. new talent coming through as well. Um, so our focus, uh, Spotify is very focused on, like, as, as I mentioned before, we've we've got programs like Radar, which is about, which internationally all all um, music teams at Spotify, that's to cherry pick and, and to really point to artists that we believe are going to have an important year. Mm-hmm. We support that, again, editorially and with marketing. Our artists to watch lists um, very early. Like, mm-hmm. that's a super early kind of, as it says, it's like one, one t- artist that we believe, like, you should, it should be on your radar. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like that when we see the, the artists breaking through, like, pretty much they've always all been on our list as well as all been on our, through our editorial programming. That, that's an important thing to continue to see to happen. The other thing I'm excited about is the new opportunities for providing more context about music. And that's to do with technology. So, for example, DJ is a new feature. You spoke about Blend. All of these new features put a bit more fun and joy into an engagement, so into listening to music. So whether that's trying to figure out what your musical taste matching up with, with, with a yeah. friend or with, with another musician... It's just another fun way to engage with music. The the jam feature, which saved me over the, the holidays because my <laughs> brother and I fight over who gets to control the music in the car. Yep. Solved. <laughs> we didn't fight um, because that allows you to create a playlist collaboratively in real yeah. time. So we're looking at all of these interactive ways to get people more involved in music. So it's not just passive. Um, so whether you... You discover music through a playlist that my team and I have curated. Whether you discover it through Blend or DJ, that's that. That is the goal for us. It it doesn't matter how you discover right. it, um, and we want to be able to provide all of these th- different entry points for discovery and for new artists. That's a, a really, really yeah. cool way to think about it. It's like you're trying to, you're the bucket and you're trying to add as many faucets as possible to exactly. fill that bucket yeah. in and whatever here. way, yeah. like whatever, it's up to the user, whatever you yeah. want, you exactly. do, but like we want to be here to catch you and, and push you into that community totally. after you've discovered that person. And the Spotify app you've probably noticed is getting more visual as well. I this I have this question on here. <laughs> I have this question on here. I have yes. noticed this. Yes. So, I mean, that's one of the other things that, that we've, you know, we thought about in a world where visual component mm-hmm. um, is become is more important coming to the fore. Yeah. How do we provide that for artists to communicate? So, um, and obviously very short form content as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is now the ability to have what we call canvas and clips for artists where you can upload and artists yeah. can upload a short clip. Um how they use that is completely up to them. It's interesting to see the differences in how artists really use that tool. And that's where the creativity comes from. Like, I think sometimes, again, I get asked, well, what do you want? I'm like, well, I don't, like, what do you want? How does it represent you? Like, you think about when an, when someone is, is watching this little clip, um, 
I mean, the creativity that is yours. Like, think about how, yeah. what you want to what you want to communicate. So, those visual elements. Um, along with the music, um, are becoming more into the foreground. Yeah, I, you just opened up a can of worms for me. Yeah, I, one, I just think I've been really fascinated with like the growing intersection of like visual entertainment and music. Like, I feel yeah. like it's getting bigger and bigger every year. And like the pinnacle of it to me was like a Taylor Swift theatrical release, you know, and, and a Beyonce theatrical release was like, oh, like music and and like what used to be very traditional movies and and music is like we're getting closer and closer by the year. And obviously things like TikTok short from content, mm -hmm. as you're describing, yeah. like did that immensely. And I also think it's so fascinating though, that how in this world, like where now we have informa infinite information mm -hmm. at our fingertips at all times, it's almost more desirable to have something curated for you. Like that now the limiting is value. Like I like that my Discover Weekly every yeah. week is only 30 songs. Yeah. If it was 150, I wouldn't be able to finish it. So I'd probably never start it. But yeah. like I, my number one streamed artist of the last year, someone I found on Discover Weekly. So yeah. like, it's so cool that I think, and interesting, like again, like media swings, like this weird pendulum of like how specifically like what you do, like curation and this limiting of like, I want to understand what you want before you even know that you want it. Yeah. So then I can serve it to you is the future and and so interesting to see like how social and, and technology will move in that direction my hot take prediction love it and this is Give mine this is my my personal prediction is that actually in a world where um you've got as you said infinite content you've got it at a pretty much at a drop of a hat mm -hmm. to recall you are booked and busy Hyper curation is my prediction of where things will swing. Yeah. Hyper curated, personalized yep. list or recommendation w across a lot of different content forms, not just music, is going to be where people look to. Um, you're busy. You've got yeah. 101 things to do in a yeah. day. What are the top 20, like, what are the 20 new songs I need to know this week? Knowing that, Selena, you know my taste. Tell me what the 20 <laughs> yeah. is um, in my five-minute break that I've got. Right. Um, so that hyper-curation um, and that personalization will become more, impo more important. Totally. It's so, again, it's so funny. Like, the more access you have to things, the less you want it. <laughs> it's yeah, like a weird... information overload. There's yeah. actually a study that was done with Head & Shoulders where they had a bunch of different scents for their shampoo and conditioner, and they weren't selling where they wanted to, and they actually made the decision to pull back and only do a few and it just went off yeah. the shelves like people wanted it when they didn't have to do more thinking of which side yeah. to get yeah absolutely so. and we well, there's always that 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 old saying i've forgotten the origin but you know if i had more time i would write i would have written you a short letter mm -hmm. um it's much harder to simplify and to yeah. really boil it down to the key points, whatever it is, including a presentation or mm -hmm. anything you might be doing. Like there's a real skill in that. Mm -hmm. Same thing with when I think about music and songwriting, like it's to keep things simple is really hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the very on the point recommendations of that a speak to your, to your taste um, but really nail the lack of time and people's attention spans that are that are caught in various different ways throughout the day. That is a sweet spot in terms of getting you. Here is the edited version. Right, you, I know that you trust me. Like we build, I, we talk a lot about building trust in our listening experiences because if you have a bad experience, or if I don't get it right, we don't get it right. You're going to question. So we, we put a lot into making sure that that you come back and you feel like, yeah, they get me by and large. Like 99% mm -hmm. of the time, they, they nail their recommendations. I'm going to – I trust that recommendation. I mean, I – do think that that is literally the reason as a Spotify user, I like Spotify more than Apple Music. Like, because it's it, there, it's such an interesting business because in theory, like all the music's the same. So what really differentiates you is the playlisting. It is this innovation. It's yeah. this like, can we curate better than somebody else? Like really, I think like what your team does is so yeah. much of like the soul of like how Spotify builds a brand and stuff. So and I don't the, know. It's so the interesting. The combination of working with the product teams as well. Yeah. It's, it's that beauty of 
Um, Because I I hear a lot, like it's human curation or machines. And it doesn't ever have to be like a... a diametrically opposed opposition. We it's we've never thought of it that way. It's you use technology in your daily life, right? Yeah. To communicate to get your message out to your to an audience. We do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, technology is there to to enhance what you do. Um, you know, we have over a hundred editors at Spotify. We have over five hundred million users. We can't manually create <laughs> yeah. a playlist for yeah. each one of you as much as we, yeah. w- we would like to. Right. And so we have to think about clever uses of, with the product teams, of course, um, who are very talented, um, to think about what is the best application of that to scale that human expertise. And then also the te- technology surprises us. Something like Blend um, Daylist is an example of where all of that comes together, right? Technology is applied in a playful, joyful mm-hmm. way, which is my favorite application when you see things like that because it's a good um, example of, hey, look, you know, machine learning and AI can also create these things that really give us enjoyment and um, and a sense of, of fun and playfulness. Yeah, no, it literally, like, Dayless gamified the music experience, yeah. which is such yeah. a... I also weirdly think this is something completely unrelated, but, like, Duolingo has done this so well. If you guys have ever, yeah. like, actually yeah, played it. Yeah, I'm on, like, yeah. day 97 It's like Duo. It's a video. It's not a, a language app. Like, it's yeah. a video game. It's a video and game, And I think, yeah. like, I love when I see Spotify. Like, Playlist in a Bottle was another great example yeah. of, yes. me, of, like, gamifying that experience. Yeah. Like, I think stuff like that is going to be huge in the next year. Yeah. And just in terms of, like, physically incentivizing people to use those features that are already in the app is so interesting but also going back to like launching a vertical or like the vertical video feed like i have always i mean for years i always thought spotify was going to launch not never be a full social platform but a more or less discovery based like for you page adjacent type thing of like a 15 second to one minute trailers for songs or or audiobooks even Mm -hmm. for podcasts and audio like as a user i would love that yeah so like how are you thinking about uh spotify's like getting more visual that's definitely um i mean you see you've seen the you are seeing the 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 beginnings of that Mm -hmm. that will develop as well Mm -hmm. um and it's a combination of uh spotify is not a social media app. Right. So it's not exactly the same, but we we have already realized and and understand that um, music is community based. People do, especially different different ages, different communities want to engage in music a different way. Some like the gamification of things like Daylist. Um, others like DJ. They turn it mm-hmm. on. And again, like and it's not just one thing. Again, it needs to suit your day and your different needs. And you, it can be many things in one day for one person. So video became even more important, particularly when we added podcasts, because mm-hmm. actually that's that's also a component that, that listeners and the audience wanted to see. Um, that went really well when we introduced it. And now we're looking at, well, does it? can we apply it to music and artists? And so you're beginning to see that. Um, so I think you will see in in the in the not too distant future an increase in those kind of engagement videos. Yeah. Um, more tools for artists to express themselves. Um, no matter what kind of creator you are in terms of whether it's audiobooks, podcasts, or music. That's awesome. I, and again, it's like just the ever growing Spotify tool yeah. belt. It's like But also then understanding like the data and the analysis analysis for yeah. you as as a creator is like, okay. Um, in Spotify for artists and in the in in the back end where you see your audience like providing that that information and the metrics for you so you can get an idea of what your audience looks like. Yeah. Where are they? When are they engaging? I mean, I think that's even when you were talking about too yeah. like this uh human versus like AI curation yeah. process too, like I think that's even it's weird that we're in a very or, right? Yeah. It's like things are done by man or things are done by yeah. AI when I think exactly what you said is it's an and. Like yeah. your team will be better at physically curating playlists when they have an increase of data that is gathered from yeah. things like day lists and stuff like that. Like you will be able to understand the fandom better. I also just think in general Spotify is like very ahead when it comes to AI, which is really cool and interesting to hear you talk about. It's it's a fascinating area. It's it's really important. It's a, it's a transformative technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And we're just at the beginning of this very long journey. And I mean that in terms of like just the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. With, with AI. Yeah. Um, but I am excited to see, as always, what creatives do with new technology. Because all the innovation comes from someone who's creative, who takes the technology and creates and create something new. It always comes from a creative person. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm interested to see. There will be people, artists, in whatever discipline, who will create something that is new and will surprise mm -hmm. us. So that's what I look forward to. And my my last question to you is, because um, we do a lot of like predictions and stuff, mm -hmm. but is there a new artist that you've discovered recently, like less than 500,000 monthly listeners that you think could potentially be like nominated for a best new artist in a year or two or like you think is like on the brink of something great? We've actually just released um, all of our artists to watch lists across okay. every... So each of our... Mm -hmm main playlist brands like Most Necessary for Hip Hop, Juniper for, for Singer Songwriter. Um, we've, we've released our list of that. So um, I would look there. I don't want to... Uh, Narrow it down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. But, but I mean, those lists are good because, for example, as I said, like I Spice and, 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 and Coco were, were on those artists to watch lists mm -hmm. like a few years ago. And, and here we are. Um, Cool. I'll have to, I had, I made a playlist once like over a year ago and it got like over 10,000 follows overnight. I didn't realize, but I was curating like the different artists that I thought um, were going to blow up soon. And I was trying to find people with less than like a hundred thousand yeah. uh, monthly listeners. I can follow up and with I'll, some recommendations for you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll, yeah. yeah. Cause that's I'd what love you're to add specifically some looking for that. Like we can, new we can give you yeah. some, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm talking about the list you said, one of my artists who I've been obsessed with is Aiden Bissett, and he yeah. was on yeah, yeah. that list, and I think he's going to be huge in the next few years. It's pretty, I have to say, it's really accurate. But to your point, you you mentioned what else is coming down the line. Like, I think Countdown Pages is an interesting tool that I we've saw launched that, yeah. recently. So it just enables, again, we're thinking about ways where, as an artist, how do you create excitement for your release? So Countdown Pages for an album, for example, is where... Um, an artist can put a countdown page and it counts down to the album release date and you can choose to to follow and to get a notification. Mm -hmm. It'll tell so it'll come back and tell me, okay, yeah. this album that you've been waiting for out now, go in. Um, and actually the artist can update content and keep people coming back. So again, you've That's got cool. that repetitive mm -hmm. behavior. Yeah. Come back and and I've got a new message or whatever it might be like. Again, you can be creative with it. Um, that is an interesting feature and actually the results like 80 percent of uh the users who did follow on countdown page came back in week one to listen and that's, that's a really crazy high conversion wow. metric it is and it's important for uh artists particularly when you know on, on the first heat of that release when yeah. you're thinking about um, you know, building momentum or even chart positions. Yeah, or pitching themselves that. too. Like yeah. they want to be able to show, oh, this is how many people are in my yeah. countdown right now. Like, exactly. This well, is how many you can us expect. Because yeah. I'm like, wow, that mm. I wasn't expecting that. Like some, a lot right. of times you get surprised. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we always like to end the show with like mm -hmm. a prediction. That's something we're okay. going for. What so is something you think is going to change about music in the next year? Um, I think the use of AI in music creation Interesting. Uh, we will see, and we are seeing already, artists who are embracing AI creation tools. You probably already don't know some of your favorite songs. Have no, I probably that. don't. Um, but I think over the, the the next few years, we will see legitimate uh, AI ap applications of AI software or likeness and voice, where it's been signed off by by the artist, and and that will become, or also, what might be something that's not too far on the horizon because we see it in other countries like Japan mm -hmm. is um, artists who choose to have a virtual avatar. They're an artist, I but mm -hmm. how they present themselves will be an yes. avatar. Yeah. I that, like yeah. the Lil because I think yeah. I, I was saying like Gen Alpha, I think is going to be the most private generation since yes. the invention of the internet. And they're going to lean towards, they also grew up on Roblox. Like Dude, they love an thinking. avatar. Yeah, and it's linked again with gaming. So in yeah. gaming, you have your avatar, yeah. you have your, your gamer so tag. Cool. 
we're already kind of seeing that, but I think that's going to break more into the mainstream. So it's yeah. not like AI is, uh, AI is going to replace yeah. a musician. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an artist yeah. who has a definitive decision to not present their who chooses an avatar to right. present yeah. themselves. Kind of like Sia, but instead of yeah. a, a Dun- dancer. Punk yeah, like, exactly. It's not entirely new, right? right? Yeah. And it's so funny how people yeah. think it's out of cra- like like crazy. But and exactly. I'm like, no, dude, Like all these kids who play Minecraft are going to grow up and they're used to being a little Minecraft character and they're going to like that. Exactly. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. So. Well, Selena, like, thank, thank you so much you. for... for talking with us this was literally one of the most enjoyable conversations i had like i i felt like we could have gone for hours we definitely could have (laughs) uh i think we need like a part two but this is thank you so much i mean i i've really loved talking to you so